Well, test went fairly well in here, so hopefully if you're watching, you did a great job on your test also. Uh, I do want to take just a few lessons here to talk about one last concept and probability what we've been looking at oftentimes at the college level is paired in a class with statistics. I do want to talk just a little bit about statistics, not going to go in great depth, nothing like what you would get in a college class, but at least enough of an introduction that when you see it at the college level, uh, you'll be ready for it. By the way, this is a topic that a lot of different majors take. Um, even majors you might not think would be related with math just because statistics play such a vital role in everything we do. It helps to guide our decision making in just about all fields. So even if you're not a mathy person, statistics very likely a class that you'll end up taking at the college level. If you would get this definition down for statistics, statistics is the study of collecting, organizing, it's the study of collecting, comma, organizing, comma, analyzing, comma, and interpreting numerical data. Statistics is the study of collecting, organizing, analyzing, and interpreting numerical data. Basically, numbers, doing lots of stuff with numbers, a good way to put it. Collecting, organizing, analyzing, and interpreting numerical data. Obviously, collection of data. Right? There are people, there are research teams out there that are paid big bucks to just collect data. And uh, people do this off websites and they collect your personal information. Um, there are uh, people who go door to door, there are telemarketers who call, there are surveys that are done, try to collect data all the time. Once data is collected, you've got to organize it to do anything with it. A bunch of numbers that are all jumbled up make no sense, but you organize the information analyze the information, and finally, well, what does it mean? Interpreting that information. Two categories of statistics for you to know. First of all, we have what are called descriptive statistics. Descriptive statistics. Now, if you think in English class, if you were to do a description, you would be telling about uh, different facts about something. Maybe uh, facts about uh, hair color, eye color, maybe facts about a house, maybe facts about what the person likes. Descriptive, um, if you will, your definition is kind of just the facts. Descriptive statistics really kind of just the facts. What is true? For instance, uh, what is the average income in America? Okay, what do we do with that? I don't know, just interesting to know, I guess. That's descriptive. Um, what is the average family size? What are we gonna do with that information? Nothing, just good to know. Descriptive statistics. It just figures out what is true and doesn't go any further. Inferential statistics. Let me write that word on the board because that's not a word we use all the time. Inferential, by the way, what's the root word here? Infer, infer right? You remember from English class, infer means to draw a conclusion. So inferential statistics are used to draw conclusions. Inferential statistics are used to draw conclusions. STEM projects that many of you did. It wasn't just about running tests so you could get some numbers. It was about running tests, getting numbers so you could draw a conclusion about what is true, what is best, what is worst, what is most effective, least effective. Inferential statistics. Uh, for instance, um, when COVID happened, right? I looked at a lot of statistics on a pretty regular basis trying to see what is going on. What can we infer tr to be true based on these statistics, right? How many remember the numbers like hospitalizations for those under 70 were really, really low at first? So we could infer, okay, if you're not 70 years old and you don't really have health problems, then you're probably not really at risk to be seriously hurt by it. You might get it, but it won't hurt you. How many remember hearing that a lot when COVID first happened? Okay, that's inferential statistics. We're gonna look at the numbers and we're gonna draw a conclusion from them. Obviously, inferential statistics, much more useful. Some more terms to know along these lines. I want you to get this term down, population. Population. For a study that is done, the population of a study refers to everybody in that group. Okay, a population of a study refers to everybody in a group. You might write down as an example, a census is a population study. It literally counts every person, supposedly, who's legally, supposedly, in the United States. We're gonna get off that topic though, all right? But a population of a study. For instance, if we wanted to find out about, you know, the favorite food of people at Grace Christian School. Well, everybody at Grace Christian School would be a member of the population. Now, would we actually poll every kid at Grace Christian School? Why not? There's only, what, 160 of us? We could do that. That'd be pretty easy. 
what if we wanted to find all the favorite foods of everybody in the state of Georgia? Are we going to pull everyone in the state of Georgia? No. No. What we're going to do is we're going to call maybe a thousand people in randomized cities across the state of Georgia, find out what their favorite foods are, and we'll say that probably these thousand people are probably a pretty good representation of the millions of people who live in the state of Georgia. Does that make sense? So rather than polling the entire population or polling everyone, we just take a sample size. Sample size refers to the number, the, the people in the population that are actually researched or the items that are actually counted out of the population. It's the, the portion of the population you are studying. The portion of the population that you are studying. It does help to look at my notes. By the way, we represent sample size with the letter N. N is going to refer to the number of people or whatever that are, our uh, number of things that are requested for the um, for the statistical study. TV ratings work this way. Any of you uh, maybe seen your parents have this little booklet that's mailed to them and say, hey, would you fill out this TV ratings guide or radio ratings guide? I've got them that usually include money. And I say, hey, here's some money in advance thanking you for uh, taking this survey. So, of course, I pocket the money and I don't bother with the survey. Actually, I did, I did once because they sent more money. And I was like, hmm, well, I, I guess I could fill it out. Uh, but anyway, they're not going to send that to everybody. They send it to a randomized group. I happen to be in one of the lucky houses that gets that and gets the money. Uh, but anyway, the portion is tested, right? So if we're like, well, we're not going to ask everybody at Grace Christian School what their favorite food is. But, you know, maybe we'll ask, uh, you know, two people from each class. That's what, 24 of the nights, include K3, K4, K5. All right, so that's 30 people we're going to ask. Now, how accurate is that going to be if we only ask 30 of you? Mm, yeah, however accurate. But, I mean, 1,000 people? You ask 1,000 people a question, you're probably going to get a pretty good result. By the way, how many of you, maybe during election time, you've seen polling that shows so-and-so is leading so-and-so right now? How do they do that? They call up people, and once they've got a thousand people who've answered the phone and answered their question, they release the data. And they say, according to this research team, again, they're getting paid money to call you and ask you questions, this is the data of a candidate who seems to be leading right now. Now, obviously, those numbers can be skewed because people who aren't home can't answer their phone. That means people who actually have jobs usually don't get uh, polled very often. Um, uh, people who are willing to answer their phone. How many of you, even on your own phone, you don't recognize the number, you don't answer it? I mean, you always answer. It doesn't matter who. You're just like, I don't recognize this number, but I'm going to answer it anyway. All right, so we got one person who answers it. I'm, I don't answer the phone if I don't recognize the number. So I never get polled because I never answer the phone. And so I miss out on a chance to share my input. Um, not that it matters, but that's one reason why they always do a margin of error as well. It's kind of based on past history. But there's a sample size. Not the whole population gets questioned, but the sample size. Now, an actual election is supposed to be a population study. Everybody's supposed to vote. The problem is it still is just a sample size because not everybody actually cast their vote. But that's a topic for government class, not this one. What you're actually studying are called variables. What candidate are you going to vote for? Okay, that's the variable. What's your favorite food? That's the variable. What TV shows do you like best? That's the variable. Um, in science projects, STEM projects, right, your variable is, see, Maddie, what was your project about? Buoyancy. You were the buoyancy. Okay, so uh, it was... Uh, how much uh, weight can do these different liquids hold up, right? So the weight that was your variable, and you, you remember those terms from STEM project. With variables, there's two categories of variables. One type of variable is what we call quantitative. Quantitative. Again, a lot of terms in this uh, the outset of the chapter. We'll get to some math here in a minute. Quantitative variables, well, do you see the root word? Quantity. Okay, a quantity is a number. Quantitative variables are numbers. Quantitative variables are numbers. Something that can be boiled down into numbers. For instance, um, favorite food, would that be a number? No, that, that's not quantitative, is it? Um, how much money do you make? Could that be a number? Okay, that would be quantitative. Then do you see the difference? So not all variables are quantitative, uh, but if they are numbers, they're quantitative. Two types of quantitative variables. We could have what are called discrete quantitative variables. Now, this doesn't mean they're careful in what they say. Discrete has the idea of being countable. Discrete means countable. For instance, um, if we took a, a survey of how many students are in each of the classes at Grace Christian School. Well, K3 has, Abby, do you know how many are in the K3? 
11 in the K3. All right, K4, I think, is, anybody know? Your mom helps out there. I don't know if she's ever mentioned. I think it's like 16. K5, I know, is 23, I feel like, in K5. No, you don't help K5. You're first grade. 23 in K5. Uh, I think 23 in first grade. 24 in first grade. Those are countable. Those are discrete, okay? But what if, for instance, we wanted, instead of something like that, we wanted to, um, I don't know, test your vertical jump like we did in PE back in the day? Well, that's not something you count, that's something you measure. Measurable statistics are called, or uh, measurable variables, still numbers, right? They're still quantitative, are referred to as being continuous. Continuous quantitative variables are measurable. Things like height, weight, jump. Um, Things like that. So continuous, it's, it's something you'd have to measure to figure out. Discrete is something you can actually count. But both of these refer to numbers. Both of these are quantitative. The other type of variable we could have, though, like favorite food, what color are your eyes, things like that. These would be qualitative. Qualitative variables. What's the root word in qualitative class? Quality. quality. It's a quality about you. Your hair color is a quality about you. It's a fact about you. It's not a number. We can't even make it a, well, as technically with a computer, you RGB numbers. But anyway, you can't really make it a number. You shouldn't try to make it a number. It's just a quality. It's a, it's a, it's a, a fact, if you will. Um, you know, what, uh, what political party are you? Well, that's not a number. That's, you know, Republican, Democrat, Independent, prefer not to answer, you know, whatever. Um, you know, what type of car do you drive? Okay, that's not a number, right? Um, things like that. Do we understand the difference between quantitative and qualitative? All right, let's review just these terms for now. Turn to page 553. And let's look at some exercises that will kind of help us to uh, make sure we understand these different terms here. It's kind of threw a lot of stuff at you all at once. Page 553, look at the example problem here. It says in each situation, identify the population, the sample, and the variable. Then classify the variable as quantitative. Uh, and then if so, either continuous or discrete, or qualitative. Read letter A for us, and then we'll talk through the uh, example answer there. Read letter A, though. Brandon? All right, so look at notice where it says the population is going to be all the maple trees in the forest. He's going to infer that maple trees normally are a certain diameter, they're a certain bigness, okay, right? So instead of measuring every single maple tree, because let's be real, ain't nobody got time for that, he says, well, I'm going to measure six of them, and I'll kind of take an average of it. So he's going to measure six, but the population is all the trees. What's the sample size, class? just the six he's actually going to measure. Does that make sense? The variable, well, what's he actually measuring? Diameter. diameter. He's testing to see what is the diameter. So that's the variable. Is that quantitative or qualitative? Quantitative. That's going to be a number. The diameter of the tree is going to be an actual number of inches, presumably. Does that make sense? So it's quantitative. Is it then continuous or discrete? Mm -hmm. Continuous. It's not something he's going to count. It's something he's going to measure. Does this help maybe make these terms make a little bit more sense? Look at the next example. Read, uh, read letter B for us, Genesis. Um, I want to know what Jack got on the first one. I would not walk around the lunchroom. I would sit there and eat. Uh, but anyway, what's the population class? The, the kids at the school. All the kids at the school. She's not going to check with all of them. Instead, she's going to use a sample size of only. 20 kids. What's the variable? The thing she's trying to find out, the eye color, right? Is that quantitative or qualitative? qualitative. That is qualitative because that's not something you can put a number to. Does that make sense? You can find a number of students with that eye color, but the color itself, the variable itself, is qualitative. Making sense. I'll look at one more example here. Read letter C if you would, Michael. Even his father might cause him wonders if he has more, fewer, or about the same number as the other men at his college. To find out, he has 10 other college students as they leave chapel. All right, so he's like, I wonder about this. So as they're leaving chapel, hey, how many ties do you have? Why do you ask? Just want to know. And anyway, so he's only got five ties. He's like, hmm, is that a lot or is it not? Um, I don't know. I probably got, I just threw away some ties. I got some new ties and threw away some old ties that were starting to get shredded on the corners, but... 
I don't know, I probably have 30 something ties. I like ties. I don't like wearing them, but if I have to wear them, I like having lots of ties. Anyway, um, I like cool math ties too, by the way, just throwing that out there. Um, what's the population here, class? All the men at the college, right? But he's not gonna ask all the men at the college. Instead, he only asks 10 of them, right? So the, pop, the sample size, rather, is just the 10 people. What's the variable? How many ties do you got, right? Is that qualitative or quantitative? Quantitative. That is a quantity. That's a number of ties that people have, okay? Is that discrete or continuous? Discrete. They don't have to measure how many ties. They will count how many ties. Does this make these terms make sense to you? All right, now with all of this, though, there comes this idea of, okay, what's normal? Right? Even Gideon in his example is like, I got five. Is this normal or is this not? He asks the one guy, how many ties do you have? And he's like me. He's like, I got 30 ties. Wow. He asks another guy, how many ties you got? I only got this one. I wear it every day. And he asks another guy, he's like, oh, I got probably, I don't know, a dozen or so. Why do you ask? Just curious. He asks another guy. Well, he goes around. What he's going to do is he's going to take all those numbers and find out what is normal. Normalcy is what we call measures of center. And there's different measures of center we can use. That's the next thing in your notes. Measures of center. If you want to in parentheses, this kind of helps you understand what is the normal, uh, uh, normal state of things in a, in a given situation. There's different ways you can find measures of center. The first measure of center, and this should, by the way, sound really familiar because we talked about this in junior high years ago. Haven't talked about it since, though, and that's the mode. The mode refers to the number that occurs most often. The number that occurs most often. So Gideon goes around and says, how many times you got? I got 30. How many do you got? I just got this one. How many do you got? I got 12. How many do you got? I got 15. How many do you got? I got seven. How many do you got? I got five like you, man. I got six. I got eight. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, I got two ties. And I've got 20 ties. And uh, well, I mean, this college he goes to, you have to have ties. All right. So everybody's got at least one. All right. So there's the 10 different people he asked, right? Is there any one number that seems to pop off like, oh, lots of people said this number? No. And very often, there won't be a mode. But let's suppose that a couple of different people said 12. Well, as he's asking them, he's like, you know, there were a few different people that said they had 12 ties. 12 ties seems kind of like the normal thing to have. Granted, there's this weirdo who's got 30, and there's this guy who's only got one who's kind of sad. But I mean, the normal thing seems to be a dozen ties. Do you see that mode, the number that occurs most often, is maybe a good measure of center, a good measure of what's normal. This doesn't require a whole lot of math. That's a nice thing, right? You just, what number occurs a lot. The other thing that's really nice about the mode, I want you to get this down, is you can use the mode for qualitative statistics. For instance, what, are eye, what eye colors do we have? Well, let's look around the room for a minute. Let's see, Audrey has greenish blue. You're calling them blue. Brown. Brown, my Jesus. Brown, that's greenish brown. <laughs> Green, brown. brown. Okay, which one occurred most often, class? Brown. brown is what's normal. Okay, for this room, I'm blue. All right, so you and me, we got this. And then we got a couple green and then four brown. All right, but it's, we can do that with qualitative. The other measures of center we really can't do with qualitative data. So, qualitative data, the only measure of center, the only normal you can refer to is the mode. A couple other things with the mode. It is possible for you to have what is called a unimodal set of statistics. A unimodal set of statistics. This means there is one value or one response, maybe with you know eye color, that kind of pops out as, wow, that one stands out as being normal. Does that make sense? That's unimodal. It is possible that you could have a set of statistics that are bimodal. Now, bimodal would mean that there are two values or two responses that stand out. Well, let's suppose we, um, we took all the, the kids in the high school and we said, okay, what is your, uh, what is your favorite color? And uh, let's suppose uh, two kids said their favorite color is yellow. Let's suppose that five kids said their favorite color is orange. Let's suppose 10 kids said their favorite color was red. Let's suppose three kids said their favorite color was black because they're morbid like that. Let's suppose 10 kids said their favorite color was purple. And I think we have more responses than we have students at this point. Um, <laughs> but anyway, let's just suppose this is true. Do you notice there are two numbers that really pop? And they're tied. 
we would say this is a bimodal set of statistics because both numbers kind of pop off the page. However, do any numbers pop? No. There are two winners, but they don't pop. They don't stand out, do they? We would say in this case, even though there is a, there are numbers that are more than the others, it's not enough to really say, wow, these are the two favorite colors. Well, barely. I mean, red was right there. Even, even black wasn't far behind. We would say in this case, the statistics has no mode. There isn't any one thing that kind of pops off the page to you. And that's not uncommon for there not to be a, a, a mode. For instance, if you were to ask every person in the United States, what is your annual income? Guarantee you there's not one number that's going to pop off the page unless you made them round to the nearest like 10,000. Then I think 40,000 probably pop off. Okay? I think that's what about most people in the United States would be making if you made them round. But if you actually got their actual numbers, they'd be all over the place. You're really not going to get a lot of repeated values. So a lot of times you wouldn't get a mode. That's not uncommon. A better measure of center is something we call the median. Now, for those of you who drive, and even those who don't, you should know what a median is for the roadway. What's the median? That's what you do when you want to get some air. <laughs> Why? The, the curb median. <laughs> oh, you want to get air under the car. I thought you were talking about like, air, like hot, so you want air conditioning. Okay. Um, sorry. What? Okay. The median is as you're driving down the highway, it's that grassy part in the middle, right? Don't drive. Median literally means middle. But in order to find a middle value, we have to put the numbers in order, the statistics in order. Putting it in order is referred to as ranking. So we're going to say that the median is the middle value when ranked. Middle value when the statistics are ranked. So we would have to take these numbers of guys with their ties and put them in order. Let's see, 1, 5, 6, 7, 8, 12, 12, 12. 15, 30. I think that's all of them. Yeah, that's all 10 of them. All right? The middle value is what you get when you rank the statistics. So we say, okay, let's take three off this end, three off that end, one off this end, one off that end. Wait a second. If we knock these off, we got no data left. If there were another number in between them, that would be the median. And if you have two of them left, you might remember this from junior high, you'll simply average those two <coughs> average, you'll average those two middle numbers. What do you get if you average an 8 with a 12? 10. So although the mode of his data was 12 ties, the median is 10 ties. So you could say, well, the normal guy at college probably has, since I didn't ask all of them, probably has 10 ties right around there, would be normal. Three of the guys I said all have 12. So our mode would be 12, our median would be 10. Questions on that? Just rank the data, put it in order, smallest to largest, and then work your way to the middle and find that middle number. By the way, how many remember median and mode from your junior high days? Okay, good, all of us, this isn't new, that's wonderful. Um, the next thing, oh, by the way, median is represented by the capital letter M. So if you're asked for the median of a set of, st set of statistics, they may just represent that with the capital M. The last measure of center, and this is by far the most commonly used measure of center, though I won't say it's necessarily the best, but it's the most commonly used, and that's called the mean. The mean. And of course, you'll remember from your junior high days, the mean is literally the average. So the mean is the average. And this is annoying because you actually have to do math, or at least the calculator has to do math. So you would type into the calculator, 1 plus 5, help me out here, plus 6, plus 7, plus 8, plus 12, plus 12, plus 12, plus 15, plus 30, equals, and divide it all by 10. And so, uh, first one to get it? 10.8. 10.8. Someone verify your answer? Anyone else get 10.8? Anyway, something, okay, Maddie says she got 10.8. Brandon's saying he got 10.8. Okay, the consensus is 10.8. All right, that's, that's the mode <laughs> of, our, of our answers. All right, so 10.8. Notice these are all, by the way, pretty close together. Okay, these numbers are pretty close together um, here in these values. So the normal is, you know, somewhere in the 10, 11, 12 range, depending on which one you choose to pick. But the mean is literally average. You add them all together, and you divide by how many there are. The mean is represented in statistics by x with a bar over it. It's literally said x bar. 
X bar. It doesn't you know, mean a bad place you don't go to drink, but X bar, the mean. It's how it's represented mathematically. In fact, if you look on your calculator, um, you look above the uh, X squared button, you'll see that X bar notation. I'll teach you how to use that in our next lesson, whether we teach you some other functions as well or features as well. Um, but those are the TI-30XA. You've got a statistical mode on your calculator that I'll teach you how to use. But the mean, it just means the average. Now with all of this data, right, and average, by the way, that's what we do with your grades, don't we? Right? We add them all together, we divide by how many there are. Think about this, let's suppose there's a student who uh, takes a quiz, gets a 90, takes another quiz, gets a 90, takes another quiz, gets a 90, and takes another quiz, and gets a 90. What is that student's current quiz average class? 90. All right, let's suppose there's another student who uh, takes a quiz, and they struggle, they get a 65. But on the next quiz they rebound, they get a 96. That's really good. Then they do even better on the next one, they get a 100. And the next quiz, they get a 99, they just, they just miss a point for spelling. What's their average? Find that if you would, please. Also exactly 90. These two students have the exact same grade. Now here's the difference. With one of these, the grades are consistently 90. This student consistently knows 90% of the information that's asked of them. This student is probably better than that. Most of their grades are better than 90. But they did have that one lousy grade. Does that make sense? A lousy grade, an absurdly low number, or really, frankly, an absurdly high number. I mean, there's only a gap of four right here, right? The guy with one tie, that's not so different from the guy with five. Guy with 30 ties, that's a whole lot more ties than the next guy that was asked, right? These are what are called outliers. Go ahead and write that term down, outlier. An outlier is a value that is far away from the data nearest it. An outlier that is far away or unlike the data nearest it. It just, it stands out because it's so much bigger than everything else or so much smaller than everything else. Like, for instance, a student gets a 70 on a quiz and then a 68 on a quiz and then a uh, 73 on a quiz and they get 100 on a quiz. Well, 100's a, an outlier. That's a great outlier to have, but it's still an outlier, right? You wouldn't say, man, that's a straight-A student right there. Well, no, they got the 100, but that's not really normal for them any more than we would say that this student, the 65, is normal for them. It just you had a bad day, everybody has a bad day, okay, whatever. Good job bringing the grade up in spite of it. Uh, but it's an outlier. Outliers will affect the average, won't they? Considerably. Because after all, if it weren't for this, this kid's got an A plus average. But their average is all the way down at a 90 because of this outlier. When outliers are present, the median is actually the best way. Now, we don't do this for your grades. I know you wish we would. But the median is the best way to find a middle value or a measure of center if there are outliers. Because think about it. If I were to put these in order, cross it out, cross it out, average these two together, I'm getting 97 and a half. Yeah, that's pretty much where the student's at. This is a 97 and a half student who had a bad day, right? That's the best approach to finding a measure of center or a normal if there are outliers. Does that make sense? Another way to show that there are outliers or that a student's grades have been really sporadic is to take something called the range. Range shows variation in the data. Range shows variation in the data. A student who's got really high grades and really low grades, I mean, it's just whatever given day. Sometimes they have good days, sometimes they have bad days. We don't even know what we're going to expect. You know, we'd be, be real transparent. As teachers, we kind of know, okay, on a given quiz, we're kind of expecting our students to, you know, perform certain ways. So when a student, you know, gets an A and we're used to them getting A's, it's like, okay, good, they got an A. And then a student normally, like, you know, gets, you know, F's and stuff, not naming any junior hires here, but they usually get F's and stuff, and then all of a sudden it's like, an A? Like, we're going, They've been cheating on us. Oh, look at the look at that a little more closely. What happened here? And then a student like normally makes A's, and all of a sudden it's like, F? What happened? You're kind of going over the test, like, did I teach this well? You know, <laughs> because we get used to what's normal, right? We get used to a certain way things are, but variation shows changes in it, and it tells us how reliable our measures of center are. If something falls into what's considered normal, okay, that's good. If it falls outside that range, range is simply the difference between the highest and lowest. Oh, you can write that yourself. Range is the difference between the highest and lowest values. If you have a really big range, 
you've got a really wonky data set potentially with at least an outlier somewhere in there, maybe more. So the range can tell us whether or not we've got some wonky data that we're dealing with. These two students both have the same grade. They both have the same average. But if you look at the range, I mean, what's the range of student one class? Zero. <laughs> it, every single grade's been the same. That's really consistent. Um, what's the old saying? Consistency, it's only a virtue if you're not a screw up. Anyway, uh, but what's the range for the other student here? 35. Okay, that tells me that this average probably isn't really reflective of the student's ability. If they've got a range that big, eh, probably the average isn't the best move. And if you get a very big range, that's another indication to go with the median instead. Again, we don't have that luxury as teachers, okay? So unfortunately, that reading quiz you forget to read and get that zero and all your other grades are 80 or better, but there's that one zero. Unfortunately, that outlier, since we have to take the mean, it does hurt you. But um, if we were doing a statistical study as opposed to just averaging grades, the median would be the one we'd want to go with. Questions on this? Does that make sense as far as the concept goes? Mode, honestly, is not used very often. Now, it tells what number occurs most often or what value occurs most often, but it's not used very often because you don't always get a mode. Sometimes you get two modes, and that's kind of what do I do with that? Um, median and mean are really the big two. Median, you use class if there are outliers or if you have a very big range. If there aren't really any outliers or the range is pretty small, then you'll go with the mean. And that's how you choose which is the best measure of center to display what is normal. Okay, questions on this? Do we remember learning this in junior high, this part here? How many say, okay, I remember the terms, but it, we didn't go in that much depth in junior high. Of course, I don't remember it. Okay, questions on this? Let's turn over to page 557 then. Page 557. And uh, let's take a look at problem number four. Now, number four is actually a lot like what we did earlier before we got into mean median mode. So it's just a quick review for you. I want you to do what we did on the last example problems, and then we'll get into mean median mode. So number four, just a quick review over these first few terms, like population, sample, variables, quantitative, qualitative, stuff like that. Take a few minutes to work. Number four. Take a look. Number four, go ahead and read it for us if you would. Kendall? All right. So, what is the population of the study here? Audrey? All the members of the track team. Right? He's trying to say, I'm faster than all of them, so all of them, which is actually only how many people on the track team? Seven. seven, right? There's only seven. So the population is the seven guys on the track team, probably the seven who run the mile, okay? It's probably not everybody on the track team. It's probably just the seven who actually run the one mile. Because um, in track, you know, everybody does different events, right? Y'all familiar with that at all? Olympics, you don't have one guy doing all the events. People have their own special things they do. Well, anyway, uh, what's the sample size here, Abby? Um, the four members who studied. 
There we go. He only records the mile times for four of them. He figures, well, four out of seven is probably enough. I'll go home. I don't have all day to sit out here and watch them run miles. Um, why not just have all seven run at once and record it? I don't know. But anyway, four, four members. Uh, what is the variable that we're studying here? Uh, Maddie? The time to run one mile. Good. Is this a qualitative or quantitative? Genesis? Quantitative, because it's a number, right? It's an amount of time in, in minutes and seconds, presumably. Um, and is this uh, continuous or is it discrete? Michael? Continuous. Continuous. You're not counting their, their miles. You're measuring it, right? Timing it with a stopwatch. So it's continuous. How many of all five answers correct? All right, questions on that. Does it make sense? It's kind of reviewing over those. Turn the page and let's look now at uh, some of this mean, median, mode, and range stuff. Look at number nine and uh, read number nine for us if you would. Kendall. Uh, All right, the first thing I want to do with any set of data is I want to put it in order. What's that term for putting data in order, class? Ranking. Ranked, I think was the word you wrote down there, but ranking. Make sure you know that term. So class, what does it mean to put it in order? Rank. What does rank mean? Put it in order. So let's put it in order. So we're going to write the three, eight, ten. And one way to check is I count, okay, how many numbers do I have on the page? Five. How many numbers do I have here? Five. Just making sure I copied everything down. A good way to check. You don't want to mess things up by not writing all the values. All right, so we've ranked the data. The first thing it says is find the mode of the data. Remember, the mode class is the number that occurs most often. It's the number that stands out. It kind of pops off the pages. Wow, a lot of, you know, a lot of days he sold that many cars. Okay, well, what's the mode? There isn't any. No number pops off here as being a uh, most commonly occurring number. So there is no mode. Um, the next thing it asks for is the median. Again, what does median mean, class? The middle. Well, if you work your way from the outside in, what's the middle value, class? 10. Remember, if there's one middle value, that's easy. If there's two middle values, what would I do with them? I would add them together, I would average them. So if there had been, say, a, a 15 here, well, then as I work my way in, I come to two middle values. I would average to get 11, um, but there weren't, so I didn't. All right, the next thing we need to do is find the mean of the data. Well, class mean refers to the average. So to find the average class, we simply add them all together and divide, in this case, by five. So we add all the numbers together, we get, well, what do you mean we add them together? 46. 46, and we'll divide that by 5, and yes, we'll get 9 and 1 fifth, which is, we like decimals better than fractions here, so we'll say 9.2. The question is, which is his normal amount of cars to sell? Would it be the median or would it be the mean? Obviously, it's not the mode. Which is the better measure of center? We can tell which one to use if we go off of the range. Remember, the range class is simply the difference or distance between the highest and lowest. Well, what is the difference class? 10. Do you notice that compared to the mean and median, the range is large in that it's about the same size? This tells me the mean is rather unreliable. It's affected by an outlier. Which number is the outlier class? The 3. Is the 13 an outlier? No. Just being the biggest doesn't make it an outlier. How big of a gap is there here, class? One, that's not much at all. Two, two, five. You notice this gap is pronouncedly larger than the other gaps in the data. So since there's a sizable gap in the data, we could consider the three to be an outlier. That was just a bad day. Only sold three cars that actually sounds like a lot of cars to sell in one day. Uh, but anyway, maybe this is the owner of the business. He has all the people under him. Maybe this isn't one salesman. But anyway, three cars in one day. Well, that was a bad day for him. So rather than going with the mean, we would say that the median, or 10, is what we would consider normal for this guy. On a given day, he's probably going to sell 10 cars. Does that make sense? Questions on number 9. Do number 10 at your seats. Leah had all these test grades. We want to find the mode, the median, the mean, the range. And then what I want you to do is figure out which is the best number to use? 
the mean, the median, or the mode to represent what's normal for Leah. What's the first thing we're going to want to do here, class? Rank the data. Was rank mean? Order them up. Put them in order of the least to greatest. Ranking them helps you spot the mode. Ranking them is necessary for a median. And ranking them makes it very easy to find the range. Mean, and eh, you don't really need to rank them for the mean, but since you need them for the other three, or at least could benefit from it being ranked for the other three. Really good idea to start with that. once you've ranked it that you've written 12 values. She took 12 tests, so she was not exempt from her final exam. Looks like that third quarter got her. Because you look at the first quarter grades, those are solid. Second quarter is pretty good. That third quarter, 83, 84, and 92, probably what done her in. She had made her take. But a 98 on the final, I mean, that's solid, right? There you go. Finish strong. Abby's got her answers. Audrey has her answers. Good Brandy as well. I had to review everything. Oh, we forgot one of the hundreds. Uh, I forgot the 92. Oh. Yeah, maybe the hardest part of it. I mean, since you have a calculator, the hardest part may be putting them in order without skipping one. <laughs> so, good. All right, several people finishing up take just about 30 seconds longer, and then we'll go over these together. Does it feel like a nice break from polynomials and stuff? Yes, ma'am? Um, oh, never mind. I think we've got all the numbers in. Uh-oh, what'd you forget? I had an 85 instead of two 95s. Oh, okay. Oops. So Abby's redoing hers. Do you like a nice change of pace too here at the end of the year? Do something different. Especially since we can't go in depth because there's not time. Mm -hmm. and there's <laughs> All right, well, as we take a look at this class, what is the mode? There is a mode because there is one number that stands out above the rest. Now again, if there were two, if there were like another ninety-five, I would agree with you, Brandon. There's two of them that both have three, but I mean, there's one that only has two. I would say maybe bimodal. I would argue no mode. Here, there really is one number that stands out above the rest. It's that hundred. Would we say that a hundred is kind of normal for her class? I wouldn't. Even though that's her mode, I wouldn't say that's normal. So that's probably not the measure of center we want to go with. The next thing we need is the median. And remember, the median is the middle value. And since there's 12 of them, I'm going to take off 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Cut off the ends. We'll average those two numbers class. What's our median? 94.5. What do we say that's normal for? Well, maybe. Let's see what her average is, what her mean. By the way, what's the symbol for the mean? X bar. X bar. Okay, so again, the median is the capital M. The median is the mean is X bar. Again, that's going to come up tomorrow. Um, so for this, we had to add them all together. We added them all together. We divided by the twelve tests that we had. What is the average here, Maddie? Ninety-three point five. Did you round that, or did that come out evenly to ninety-three and a half? 
Came out like that. Nice. Okay, so 93 and a half. So one of these probably is more typical of her performance. Now, this is what's in the grade book, because that's what you have to do. But maybe 94 and a half would be a better picture of what her grades are normally. Two ways to tell. One is, are there any outliers? No. 83 is not an outlier. They're all pretty evenly distributed here. There's not a lot of variation in here. One way to tell variation is to find the gap between the largest and the smallest. Class, we call that the range. What is the range of the data? When you compare the range to the mean and median, it's nowhere close. It is way smaller, isn't it? That's a good sign. When the range is smaller than the mean and median by a lot, that tells you have a good compact data set where you can trust the mean. So here the mean is the best indicator of what she normally makes. Again, in this case, the range is just as big as the median. It's actually bigger than the mean. The mean is not a good reliable figure to use. We're going to go with the median. But here, the mean. How many said you felt the mean was the best indicator? Again, the outliers is really the key, but the range is a good indicator of that as well. Questions on this? Seem to make pretty good sense to you? All right, for homework, you have just three problems to do. I would spend a little time studying the terms. I dumped a lot of terms on you. Make sure you know the terms. But for written homework, all you have is page five, or 557 to 558. Page 557 to 558. Numbers 2, 6, and 8. Page 557 to 558, numbers 2, 6, and 8. Did your page fall out? Yeah. Oh, cheap books that Becca sells, I tell you. All right, well, have a wonderful rest of your day when the bell rings. You'll be dismissed.